Our next speaker uh, is speaking on media literacy, the First Amendment, and activities to promote civil discourse. Her name is Meg, Meg Hubeck. She's from the, the uh, University of Virginia Center for Politics. She's a former teacher from Baltimore, Maryland, has worked all over the country on civic education. She has a PowerPoint and a presentation to make today. And uh, so with that, Meg, take it away. Thank you so much. Hey, it's great to be here with you today. I'm gonna to have to rush you a little bit because in addition to being here today, I am also working with an international group from Mongolia. So I have to get back to Charlottesville. So what I want you to do is take your phone, turn it on, and go to your favorite social media app. Wouldn't your kids love this if you started class this way? Actually, this is an experiment. I've done with high school students. They love it. Okay. And I want you on your social media app to find a story on immigration. The first story that you see. Now usually, I have a lesson plan and this activity is in it. And usually what we ask the students to do is as homework or at the beginning of class to scroll through and see how many, in five minutes, how many stories on that issue you can find. So usually pick like a hot issue, but immigration, the wall, the caravan, that was all pretty recent. If you're having trouble, don't worry too much about it. So I like to call this, are you for real? Are you for real? No, you know, it's how you say it. Are you for real? Because what we're gonna to try to do in this lesson and this, uh, these activities is give you some strategies for helping students make sense of social media as well as traditional media, which is something that we all need help with. And I actually think the children will be better at it and be able to teach their parents. So, okay. Now, look at the story, don't read it, but look at the headline if you found one. And if the story appears to be biased one way or the other, put your hand up in the air. Wow. Okay, so that's usually what happens. And there's, in the lesson plan, there's a chart that the students have to make notes. And it shows them um, some, some skills to help them with this. But usually when I do it, what happens is, whatever the current topic is, on social media, the students can easily re realize that the stories they find on their social media apps are in fact biased. And you can usually tell by the headline. So we start with that because one thing I know, I have a 12 year old now, and one thing I know about 12 year olds and then about high school students is that they love their phones. They love them. And so, I don't care that they read news on their phone, but I do care that they know how to make sense of it. And fake news, fake news, which is a term I use on purpose, is really um, something that students need to be aware of and not to share, not to share. So the whole moral of the story today, don't share it if it isn't um, a factual story. So. Um, I had to start with a Thomas Jefferson quote because I work at UVA and we have Thomas Jefferson, you know, he's kind of famous. So it says, the basis of our government being the opinion of the people, the very first object should be to keep that right. And if it were left to me to decide whether or we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. But I should mean that every man should, re should, should receive those papers and be capable of reading them. So this is my charge. Now Jefferson says this in 1787. I'm not so sure he says it later uh, when he's actually running for office and he's having trouble with the newspapers. So, but he did say it in 1787. So here it is. Okay. Hey, you know who this is? Okay, so I used this the other day, and the kids had no idea. And I felt old. And then I started singing a door song to see if the riders on the storm. Like, 
they still didn't get it. But the idea, they can get the quote, whoever controls the media controls the mind. So we want to see, you all are educated people, correct? You're teachers, so I know you're the best. You're educated and smart people, and you're all social studies educators, mostly, I would imagine. Okay, go to the next one. We're gonna play a game. Who has seen Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me or listened to it on the radio? I love Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. So I made my own version, but I don't call it Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me because I don't want to be sued. So what you're going to be doing, we're going to see how, how good you are at faking, at spotting fake news. So we're going to give you a definition. It's a type of yellow journalism or propaganda that consists of deliberate misinformation or hoaxes spread via traditional print and broadcast news media or online social media. Fake news is written and published with the intent, the intent, this is an important word, intent to mislead in order to damage an agency, entity, or person, and or gain financially or politically, often with sensationalist, exaggerated, or patently false headlines that grab attention Intent and grab attention being the key words here. I, w I said that on purpose, and now we're going to play. Wait, wait, please tell me. Dun, 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 dun. So here is round one. In round one today, folks, we will be choosing which of these headlines is a fake news story or not true. Now, fake news is kind of a term that causes people to get upset, but I choose to use it on purpose with this activity because it actually, one, is talking about fake news, but also I kind of want to get kids excited and kind of fired up. So we use the term fake news. County to pay $250,000 in advertising to publicize its tight financial situation with the hope that citizens would vote to pay more in taxes. That's, that's number one. You know, if, if you get a question right, I will um, record my voice on your answering machine, if you have one. It's choice two. 40,000 people spent Christmas Eve watching a video game designer doing nothing. Three, Black Lives Matter thug protests President Trump with selfie, accidentally shoots himself in the face. Vegans furious after police share cooked breakfast photo to support farmers. You look at my picture, what do I have a lot in there? Meat, right, okay. So now thinking back to that definition, is there anyone in this room brave enough to pick the story they think is not true? Da, da, da. I don't see a brave soul. It's okay, I really am not going to beat you or anything. You think story number one is not true? That story is not true. I had it, somebody shared this story with me last year, and apparently it was shared a lot of times. Did anyone receive that sent to your Facebook page or to your Twitter feed? Or I use Twitter and Facebook, so I assume everyone used Twitter and Facebook? What, Snapchat, WhatsApp, whatever. Yeah, so that was one that was sent out. Now, what makes it fake news? Thinking back to that definition, what is the point of the headline? To grab attention. It minimizes Black Lives Matter, right? It's meant to, to create an emotional response in the person that reads it. That's why people shared it with me. I don't know what they're thinking about me, but anyway. So they share it with me because either they're, they, they really believe this and so they're going to believe it's true. There's a lot of social psychology that says we tend to believe things even if they don't make sense if they conform with what we already believe. Next one. So now it's a different challenge. You have to find the actual news story that is factually correct. Passenger allowed onto flight after security confiscates his bomb. 
Muslims see a Christmas tree being set up and then start attacking it. Fake cigarettes are being sold and killing people. Here's how to spot counterfeit packs. And 22 Clinton Foundation employees arrested on the first day of FBI investigation. Which of those is the factual story? Fake cigarettes? Okay, let's see. Yes, so apparently I did read on to find out what this story is about, but someone actually did bring a small bomb to the airport. <laughs> they confiscated it and then let him back onto his flight. I'm not really understanding, but whatever. It is in fact true. Now look at the other three. Just saw the headline, what would make it a fake news story? Attacking, yeah, so journalists aren't going to use statements like that necessarily. Um, and that is just, I, I put the picture there to throw you off. There's a man attacking a Christmas tree. Look at the Clinton Foundation employees. I actually received this one too. This is what inspired me to do this lesson, was people were sharing these things with me. Um, I don't know why. And I'm like, really? Because that's not true. Um, they wanted my opinion on it, which I guess was a good idea. But do you remember those stories about the child sex ring in the pizza parlor? Yeah, people believed it and sent it on without reading. Now, I have to confess, I have shared untrue stories. You know why? I thought they were true, or I wanted them to be true. I really and truly did. I, I'm not going to be dishonest with you. And your students probably have too. It's okay. It's okay. No harm, no foul. But we're not going to do it again. Okay? Next one. Okay. This is another good one. Sometimes when I made this up, I cried. I laughed so hard. So we're looking for the fake news story. Fake. Christian Baker, screwed by liberal court, wins the lottery. Two, pumpkin spice air freshener prompts evacuation of Maryland school. The fire department and a hazardous waste te or materials team were called. Three, Montana man elected to a job he didn't run for. And four, library vote upholds decision to okay guns, but ban wooden shoes. So which of those stories is fake? And how can you tell? Think about the definition. Look at the words that the author used as a hint, hint, hint. Okay, can you click? Yes. The first one is an untrue story, but it relates to the cake baking court case. So what about that screams fake? Screwed? And actually, liberal court, I would think so, too, because if you're really writing a story, you would just say court, right? But you definitely, in true journalism, if you see the word screwed, that's probably not a very good source to be using, just to let you know. I will tell you that the others are true. The Montana man, it was a really small town, um, and so his friends wrote his name in, and he woke up, and he was the mayor. What happens when you go to sleep in a small town? You might wake up with a new job. And then the best one, this is out in Minnesota. So apparently the librarians get really fed up with cloggers coming, <laughs> coming in with their loud clogging shoes. So they're okay with you bringing your gun, but please, by all means, leave your wooden shoes at home. I love that story. Okay. Now, wouldn't your students like to do this as the start of a class? They would. This is my favorite, and it's appropriate for this time of the year. Which of these is a real news story, a factual news story? Nation rallies around Ronald McDonald's statue that embodies the country's true heritage. I love that one. To Trump ordered execution of Obama pardoned turkeys. I, I love the fact that a turkey's pardoned to begin with. Um, and then that makes me funny. Three, city unsure why the sewer smells. <laughs> Due to election results, Yale makes tests optional. 
which is true. Third one? Okay, let's see. Yes, it's so funny. When I read this story, my colleague and I cried. We laughed so hard. The story is like, well, someone put something down the sewer that, sm <laughs> that smells. Well, isn't that kind of what a sewer's for? Anyway, it's a funny little story. Um, but the first one is kind of, is an onion story. You know the onion? What kind of source is the onion? Satire, but a lot of people don't know that, you know, right? They're always sharing these things and they think they're true because they don't know the sources. So in the lesson plan, there is a chart that shows sources and how factual they are and then on which side of the political ideology. So you can give that to students, have them keep it in their notebook and use it in all their classes, okay? I, I like the Yale makes test optional. Why is that funny? Yeah, you know, it's trying to make fun of liberal people because Yale is considered a liberal, a, the liberal elite. So they're going to make, they don't want to hurt people's feelings. They're not going to give them tests anymore. That's what it's trying to say. I also thought it was funny. And the Ronald McDonald statue is funny. They're say, trying to make fun of the whole uh, Confederate monument thing and saying that Ronald McDonald really is our heritage and we should probably embrace it. I think that's funny. Anyway, maybe not. Okay, here's another person that I showed their picture to and nobody knew who it was. Meatloaf, hey! This is my crowd, see? I should've been. So, there's a fake news. Meeting to hold open meetings is closed. <laughs> Lawmakers start quoting meatloaf lyrics just because. Suspected murderer who evaded capture for 12 years by pretending to be mute loses voice from underuse. And Democrats and Washington insiders run a child sex ring. Do you feel brave enough? Who wants to take a chance? Which one is fake? The last one? Okay, push. Yes, the last one. Um, I'll just leave that on the floor. So yeah, the, pers the person who pretended to didn't speak actually did lose their voice. That's true. These are all true stories that I found by doing a Google search. Um, and Democrats and Washington insiders run a child sex ring is another one that was shared to me on my social media. Because they didn't want me to vote for a Democrat, I guess. I don't know. Okay, this is a just, this is for fun. What say ye? Virginia man wearing trust me shirt arrested for stealing a car, police say. <laughs> true or false? True, it was true. I feel sorry for him though, bless his heart. Probably if you steal a car, you should not wear a trust me shirt. Anyway, then the lesson plan goes on to give your students skills for identifying fake news. This is my favorite. Okay, so Jonathan Haidt, who I love. Do any of you follow him or watch his TED Talks on social psychology and politics? He has these awesome um, TED Talks on YouTube. I highly recommend watching them, um, in which he suggests by using social psychology, we can actually do something about political incivility and um, polarization. So he's saying here that our brains are naturally programmed to believe things that confirm our membership in social groups, which is, explains why these stories, they're ridiculous, are shared and people believe them, because they want to, okay? Um, and I'm gonna send you this PowerPoint so you can, it's actually on the YLI website, but I will also send it to you. And you can hear him talking about that. He also has a great idea about asteroids. So Jonathan Haidt, look up Asteroids Club and watch his YouTube on it. It's real, that'll be my next presentation probably. But look at the bottom, fake news, election stories before 2016, from August to election day, 8.7 million stories were shared on social media that were not true. And think about the bots. I did this presentation before we found out about the bots. Um, the Center for Politics has been partnering with Ipsos to create a political atlas, uh, politicalatlas.org, 
And it will show you the influence bots had elections that we just had. How many were used and where they were used so that you can think for yourself. Um, Pope Francis shocks the world, endorses Donald Trump for president and releases statement. 960,000 times it was shared. Interesting. Hmm. I actually received that one too on my feed. People must have known I was working on this. If it isn't true, don't share it. Please, by all means, or even tell your students, if they suspect it is not true, don't share it. Please. So here is the um, chart that is in the lesson plan. I had my interns. It was originally from results from Brookings Institute, and then my interns took it and made it reason what, what their social media usage to reflect it and what they use for school. So you can see it's div divided by political ideology vertically, so from right to left, and then factually from bottom to top. So what I tell students is that the sources under the mainstream, minimal partisan bias that are to the top of the chart tend to be the more reliable resources. But here's the other thing. It's okay to use ones on the side, as long as that's not all you use. So I often tell them, I was telling them, if you pick to use the Daily Beast, then you probably want to go on the other side and use the Weekly Standard and look for articles about the same topic so that you get a balanced approach. And the other idea that you would read more than one article about a topic before you would post about it is also really important or write about it. So this is just a handy tool. My little intern put just no at the bottom and mostly noise. So it's just helpful. I let them do that. I let them have fun. That's their job. Okay, this is me. If you have any questions or comments, I wanna show you something else though that I created. As I was thinking about this more. I've been doing a lot on civility and polarization. I read this great article from Real Clear Politics by Carl Cannon. It's something about political tribes. Anyway, and he kind of described that Americans are entrenched in their tribe. You've heard that term, tribalism. The, what does it mean? What's tribalism? If you live in a tribe, how would you describe life? You're loyal to these people, you live with them every day, they're your peeps, your people, right? And people are really comfortable, especially in these times where things are so divisive, in just hanging with people like themselves. And so he divides American, the American electorate into these five tribes. Now, one thing that I find really interesting is if we look at the resistance, they are 75% Democrats. They would never vote for Trump. They never vote for Trump. They support Colin Kaepernick. These are your diehard Democrats, right? Um, actually, they're probably even further left than Democrats. I work with a group, and if you don't agree with it, I, I love these people. But sometimes if you don't agree with everything they say, they think you're a traitor. Like, I have differing economic positions from them. And they just really, I see the eyes rolling. I see the, the I am better than you attitude. Do you know what I'm talking about? I see everybody shaking their heads, so I'm not alone. Thank God. All right? And so those, those are those people. But look all the way over on the right. The MAGA, Make America Great Again. They're kind of the same way. 12% of voters, of all voters, they're loyal to Trump, not the Republican Party. So these are the people on the other end of the spectrum with the hats. I wish the, I wish the resistance would have hats, but they have a fist. I made those up, by the way. So um, people wearing hats, ten, they don't care at all about the Repu necessarily about the Republican Party. They love Trump, all right? Now, if we last, when Obama was president, we could have switched them. The people that fall under MAGA now would have been the resistance to Barack Obama. 
and they would the, go on the other side. They have more in common than they think with each other because they generally think they, it's their way, highway too, although not to such extent. Now here's the thing, and this is what he was talking about for this election, independent blues. These were the deciding voters this election cycle. They're not necessarily loyal to the Democratic Party. They vote generally on candidate. Issues that they care about, they tend to be Democrats, but they, they, don't, they don't necessarily always vote for Democrats. 30% are independents. They care about health care, education, and government is the problem and can be used to find solutions. And they're different from the mainline GOP because those people are loyal to the Republican Party. So that can explain a lot of what happened in 2016 because a lot of independent blues, who did they vote for? Gary Johnson, Green Party. They wrote in Bernie Sanders because they thought they, they didn't like Hillary Clinton as a candidate. So they're not necessarily loyal to the Democratic Party. I love the detached, because you may be working with the, the young people who are detached. I don't know. They're not that into politics. It's not their thing. Now, I'm having a harder, harder time finding young people that are like that, but I've seen them, believe me. I'm a, I'm a sorority advisor, and I constantly have to go there and tell people, are you voting? Well, no, you know, it's too much trouble. What, voting? And I say to them, women have only been voting less than 100 years. Next year will be 100 years. You need to vote. So anyway, that's my side story. So going along with what we know about fake news and media literacy, you also have this idea that people are in tribes. And so they're going to share their ideas with people in their tribes and kind of reinforce that social psychology that what you believe is true because everyone else around you agrees with it. I find that really interesting. And I haven't put this up on the site yet, uh, but I'm going to, so you could use it. I think I have my website put up. Okay. American Evolution. Do you know about it? Okay, good, because they've been doing a whole lot of press. And one of the things they did was they hired the Youth Leadership Initiative to come up with some project and you know what I did? I had a dream. It's a really good dream, too. I wanted to create a first freedom wall, similar to what you find in downtown Charlottesville, if you've been there. The Thomas Jefferson Center for Freedom of Expression created this chalkboard wall where people can write whatever they want. And I love that idea. So what we have done, um, is we've worked with American Evolution to create the first freedom wall. It just started. I haven't done a lot of pushing of it because it wasn't working properly. <laughs> we are a small nonprofit, you know, so it's, um, but I'm gonna show you how it works. Would you click on national topics, please? So what you do, how many are registered with the Youth Leadership Initiative? How many are not? Next time that number is gonna be very much lower because it's free and easy. You've heard me say I'm the free and easy lady, right? Okay, so please take me up on it. The Youth Leadership Initiative is free. So here is every month I'm gonna post a national question that students can respond to. And so here it is. The first one, of course, I started with Thomas Jefferson. I'm not dumb. And the second one is from Dwight D. Eisenhower. So now if you would go to under midterm election, would you please go to view? Thank you. So this is the freedom wall. So down below is this space. And we're gonna leave a comment in a second. And then you are always welcome to leave comments. I do not believe that any political campaign justifies the declaration of a moratorium on ordinary common sense. And so the day after the election, you know the ads that we had here in Virginia? They were just nasty. So I picked this quote the day after the election. 
And I put it up there, and I want to hear what students have to say about it. Also, I think if you're registered with me, I sent you a link to our mock election results show, which actually wasn't too bad this year. So it's, you can use that, and it's on the website as well. So you can click the, go down to the bottom to the student portal, just like my collection. All right, now you see that first freedom wall speak up. You click it. Oh, here we go. We have people discussing, discussing discourse, debate, and compromise. Discourse, debate, compromise. Start. Okay, now I want you to put this in VA0083. Dash 002. Yeah. That's my teacher code. It says my name, Meg Hubeck. Exciting. So far, so good. Okay, so you can put Meg in there. So I don't care what you put. Okay. And again, I'm not going to know your students, but oh, oh. So look, I can add a comment. So click under midterm elections. Not that one. That was my practice. Okay. So here's the national quote. So I imagine I'm a student in your class and I'm like, wow. Why? I, so I might put, you can type anything in that box. You could put anything down, any thought that you have. Now, the key is that you as the teacher have to approve it because you know what would happen. What would happen? Nasty. Nasties. Nasties, and you know, we're trying to show students how to be civil. How to use social media acceptably. And so I need your help with that. Okay, so now you can continue. Oh, no, go to dashboard, please. Okay, right there, go to national topics. Click on that, and you can approve that comp. Click the red box under approve, the red X, I'm sorry. So I'm the teacher, so I can approve it. And now when I refresh and go back, it should show up. Now everybody cross your fingers. <laughs> it may take a minute. There it is. It has my comment. It has an emoticon so people can respond, and it also tells me where I'm from. You can't see how it says Charlottesville? Because that's where my account is registered. So when your students put comments up there, that'll show where they're from and what they had to say, and students can agree or dislike or di like, and have, they have an emoticon, and they can also add their own statements and have a conversation back and forth. It's fairly simplistic. But I think the idea is good. And the idea is that we can share ideas and be civil to each other. I'm going to continue working on it to make it better. But I would love for you all to try it out. I'm going to be presenting it at the National Council for Social Studies in Chicago. Um, and I would love to see some comments up there. So if you have your students do that. Betsy Barton, who was running around here, did she hand out? I have handouts about it, so you can take one with you. Um, I'm really grateful to American Evolution for sponsoring and paying for the Freedom Wall. They, it's a part of the Legacy Project for Jamestown 2019. And so when we were thinking about the fact that the General Assembly started in 2019, and we're celebrating the birth of that very nascent democracy, this is a great way to do that. And we're trying to include everyone. So this is the official push, since now we see it works. Um, if you have questions, you can always call me. I answer my own phone. And after Monday, next Monday, I will be in the office. I won't be in there till then. Um, and you can contact me using that information. It's, does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, we're really, it's really, really important that we get kids to be active citizens. I will do anything to make that happen. And I have a bunch of students who can help me. They're smart. So please, don't hesitate to ask for something if we don't have it. Um, I don't get new stuff up there as regularly as I used to because I have no help. But um, I will do so. I will give you whatever you need to teach and be more effective. 
Any other questions, comments? Yes. Is there a way on that website, because we all have different PBL strategies right. and all, to share with one another to expand since you're alone, different lessons, websites, stuff like that? That is a great question. I would love to have our own social media where we could all talk back and forth. Let me see what the programming team can do. Good idea. See, this is how good ideas. Th this, these are how the things we come up with new things. So I will figure something out. Thank you so much. And keep reminding me. Um, I get busy. So with that, I leave you. And I wish you good luck. You will do great. And your students will, be, will benefit for it. So thank you so much. And I will see you soon. Thank you, Meg. That was fantastic. Really appreciate uh, your presentation there. You know, it's interesting. As a state senator, I represent about 205,000 people in Virginia. So I get emails. And uh, some of them are supportive of me. And some of them really, you know, kind of take me to task in some rather uh, uh, difficult terms. But, but here's the interesting thing. Uh, when I call them, if they leave a telephone number there or I look it up under the, uh, uh, under the state electoral uh, uh, board website and come up with a number for them, what I get is a really nice human being on the other end of the phone who's just thrilled that somebody called them to have a conversation and that they can participate in it. Uh, the other ones I get are when I call, when I send the email back saying, hey, here's my cell phone number, give me a call, let's talk about this. And the answer I generally get is either none or they, they email me back saying, well, you know more about this than I do, so I'm not going to discuss it with you. Uh, <laughs> which I don't know that they, they quite understand what they've just said, uh, but, but that's it. It's kind of like, I don't want information. I just want to be heard. I just want to get my opinion out there, and I don't, I'm not interested in a debate. So uh, that has changed uh, uh, very greatly. The other kind of interesting things about emails, I was in the House of Delegates for four years, and I got all kinds of uh, emails and constituent requests. So I said, well, gee, when I went to the Senate, I was going up two and a half times the number of people, so my workload's going to go up. It went down. Uh, people don't think to call somebody with the title senator. Just like probably people wouldn't think about calling Mark Warner or Tim Kaine, but they'll call their congressman or they'll email their congressman. You just don't think about it, but they have the same staff doing the same thing, doing the same constituent work. So we're all sometimes prisoners about the, the, the terms that we use and our assumptions about things when really uh, uh, the world is wide open for discussion and for debate. Uh, and, it, and it's interesting, and I have uh, gotten some, some really wonderful relationships with people who were never going to vote for me, uh, but they do appreciate the fact that they got heard, and I found out that that is so very, very important. And I think it's the same thing that's important for your students. Now, talking about being heard, Virginia is in a unique, lucky position because we have something that exists in the Commonwealth of Virginia called the Virginia Public Access project. Uh, this is something that is supported by charitable donations. I, I think I send you a check every once in a while, David, and uh, uh, to, to keep it open because they keep all the records for us. Records are important things. I just got back from the nation of Guyana. I spent a month there. They're trying to uh, create a modern juvenile justice system. They have the form of one but no substance. They run all of their programs and all of their facilities without anything written down in terms of what the rules are. So it's completely left to human whim. They can be extraordinarily kind and generous to kids, or they can be egregiously cruel. So they're trying to move that forward. But what they found is, is, uh, is that they just are a nation that got out of the habit of keeping records, of keeping information. Information is the key to so much in civic education, because that's where the truth lies, where you can go get information and make a determination yourself. And that's what the Virginia Public Access Project does for it. It keeps records on who's contributing to me, uh, what industries they are, uh, what people they are, the amounts. Uh, it keeps track of uh, where the voting patterns are and what's going on in the Commonwealth. And you can go on to the Virginia 
the VPAP website and make determinations for yourself uh, about where our Commonwealth is going and what's important to people uh, and what isn't important to people. And uh, the truth shall set you free. And so I'd like to introduce David Poole, director of the Virginia Public Access Project, who will be here today to discuss what they have been up to, which is, let me tell you, really good stuff. David, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, as I was walking over today, I, I live a few blocks away, and I was thinking how to start off this program. And I, I, I thought of, of teachers and how hard your job is, really hard your, your job is. One is, you know, you may, you may teach uh, middle school social studies. How many of you are middle school? The most of you. How many are high school government teachers? Okay. Well, you know that you spend a lot of your day faking it, right? That you got into being a government teacher because you took this class in college about the French Revolution and you love the French Revolution and you teach the French Revolution for like 30 minutes every year. That's, that's how much time you have for that. You have to cover a lot of ground. You can't be an expert on everything. I used to be a newspaper reporter and I felt like a lot of times I was faking it. You know, I'm down at the Capitol covering the General Assembly. Uh, in the morning, I'm covering a hearing on uh, an arcane tax provision. And, and, yeah, and in this floor session, they have a, 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 a debate on redistricting. And then there's a gun law hearing I'm covering in the afternoon. I could be a pretty smart person, but I can't really be an expert on those things. I can't really write about them um, at a level that, that is deserving and a true expert on the subject would read it and go, he knows what he's talking about. So you know, you you probably be teaching something you're like, you know, I hope no one really asks me a question about macroeconomics because that's really not my thing. I mean, you, you, I hope I'm, I hope that sounds familiar. I mean, it's tough. So, and that's just half of what makes being a teacher hard. The second thing is students, right? I mean, my, my wife just retired as a teacher and she said, school is great when there's no kids there. It's a lot easier when there's no, on days there's no kids. And that's why you're here today, right? Right? There's no kids here, right? You're getting paid and there's no kids here. And the only, except maybe the baby's crying over there. If you're sitting on the side of the room, you, you heard that all morning, but in the preschool. But so, you know, it's difficult. You have students, you, you have classes that you, you're teaching people that are, um, it, it, you know, advanced, or you're teaching kids that are just um, remedial. You're teaching kids that have that struggle, and how to convey this information is, is very difficult. So, what we do at, at VPAP is we've realized in the last few years um, we've existed to provide aggregate information about politics has been used by people like Senator Marston and other people that are actively involved in politics. But our challenge is to how to make it more accessible to everyday people. People who don't know anything about politics, people that actively try to avoid politics. And they're a lot of the fannies in your seats, right, in your classroom. So what we've been trying to do is, is try to develop some resources specific, specifically for Virginia government and um, civics teachers. And so we've, um, it's been a struggle though because we realized we've, we've done um, two summers in a row, we've brought teachers in. I have a couple of alumni over here from last summer. Um, really helpful to us to realize that our site is really geared more toward insiders, that there's a lot of assumptions that you, you know, when you, when you teach a class, you can't assume kids know anything about how things work. So. So we're, 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 we're slowly changing things around. So today I want to go through our website and show you the resources we have in our K-12 library that hopefully will help you. Um, have, how many show of hands, how many of you have heard of VPAP before today's presentation? Wow, that's great. How many of you use VPAP in your classroom? Okay, fantastic. So I hope, um, I hope there's something here today you can take away from you, with you. It's all on our website at, at vpap.org. Actually, it's education.vpap.org. Um, and so, 
Um, one thing that we have uh, on our website, if, if you're not signed up already, is VA News. How many subscribe to VA News? Okay, just a few of you. If you're interested in, in, in government and politics in Virginia, we have a team that gets up an O-Dark 100 every day and goes to every online newspaper, and every online news organization and compiles it into um, an email that goes out at 7.15. You can scroll through the headlines. So over on the right side, it's VA News. If you click on the newsboy over here. And so it's, it's headlines organized in different topics. You scroll through. You can read the headline. You can say, I don't care about that. I know that. Don't need to know that. Ooh, what about, what about that? There's a, there's a headline. It tells you what source. And there's the first few sentences. You can click through to the headline. If you don't hit a paywall, you can read the whole story. Um, so I, um, if you take out your phone and go to vpap.org and go in the uh, up hand, upper right hand column where it says subscribe, it's a free service. Um, I would encourage you to sign up. We have over 12,000 people in Virginia who start their day with VA News. So um, I'll start my PowerPoint here. Um, so basically, this is the education.vpap.org, and it's basically a library of images and videos that you can plug into your, your deck when you're te teaching about different topics. And I understand that we, when we do uh, Virginia politics and elections and so forth, we're probably only covering a week or two of your whole year, and you've got a lot of ground to cover. So hopefully this will help that. If you're teaching this and you're not an expert in it or you don't feel comfortable, this might give you some resources to, to uh, help you. All right, so I'm going to run through, and this is in this great presentation this morning about the election, but I'm going to just go through eight slides that talk about the elections that happened last Tuesday. Um, so the, um, this is the state of Virginia. You can use the traditional red and blue map, of course. And if you go to the next slide, turnout. The question is, how much would the turnout be? And the turnout was up considerably from what we've seen. This, this is compared to, it was 59%. Uh, it was high compared to recent years, midterm elections in which there was a Senate, U.S. Senate seat in the ballot. Um, didn't quite get the presidential uh, territory, but it was a considerable increase, um, which always helps the Democrats. This is, will tell you all about, you need to know about, if you can see the colors here, red and blue, the competitiveness of the U.S. Senate race. This is TV spending by week. And you can see the message involved in this campaign was totally dominated by Tim Kaine, who had the money to effectively communicate. This is the map of Virginia that's resized. Every locality is sized according to the population. So you get to really understand the power and influence of the densely populated areas in Northern Virginia. And so just to, to give you some orientation, those two big dark ones up in the corner, that's Arlington and Alexandria, which are teeny on the map. Fairfax County is the big one that comes all the way down basically to Stanton. Prince William, or this is Chesterfield County, which is outside of Richmond here. It's way over um, next to really Danville. And then the, that's Pennsylvania County. Anybody here from Chatham? It's the largest geographic county in the state, and it barely shows up. And this is the change by precinct. Every precinct, which direction it moved in compared to 2016 in the Senate race, you can see, other than a kind of section in Southside, Virginia, everything was moving in one direction this year um, in the Senate race. And, you know, every house, in every house district where there's a Republican, went into the night with a Republican incumbent, or, you know, they all outperformed Corey Stewart at the top of the ticket. You know, Barbara Comstock by six points, but it just wasn't enough. And that the lack of a, a, someone a strong top of the ticket really meant every man and woman for themselves. There was no organized GOP campaign. Everybody was kind of on their own in the House races. So I'm just going to go through some classroom exercises to try to help you think of some ways to talk about politics and government. This is what we call the turnout solar system. You can see that when you move from left to right, the total number of registered voters, which by the way is not the total population, um, but you can see in descending order 
what it means. You know, you think about a governor's race in Virginia. What could be more important if you're a Virginian than the race for governor? You know, there's a huge fall off from the presidential to the governor. And then when you get to the general assembly races, which will be next year, it falls off even more. So helping students understand that is a challenge. So the next slide, well, can you scroll through this? This might be an exercise that is helpful. In the Senate race, we put all the ads up. And uh, this was the governor's race. Not all the ads run in the same parts of the state. So people in southwest Virginia in the Roanoke TV market are seeing different ads than the people in northern Virginia are seeing. And would it be an exercise for your student? Why are we seeing this ad and not this other? Why do you think? You know, kind of get them to think about why are we hearing about guns but not about, you know, Washington uh, or whatever. So that's, that's one exercise you might think about doing. This is our Andy Warhol of the of governor's results over time. And you can see, you know, if you can find your locality on here or your region, it's really interesting to see how different regions have changed, have gone from red to blue over time. That may be something to discuss about, you know, you know you're in North Virginia, you're in Arlington. Arlington used to be... Uh, one of the reddest, uh, maybe before this, you know, back in the bird years, uh, very Republican. And now it's, it's solidly Democrat. And this is, takes a little challenge for kind of chart literacy. It's, I think it's sometimes good to present your students with something visually they have to struggle with a little bit, see if they can figure it out. This is looking at the demographics of the freshman class that got elected to the House of Delegates last year comparing it to the rest of the body. And you can see, you know, kind of they're younger, they are less white, they are more, far more female, and the college education was about the same. This is a way to get your students to think about, about this. Um, oh, I see one of, one of our new delegates over here, sorry, Delegate Turpin, um, just, just noticed you. You're part of this change in the new 19 House delegates. These are all images you can find in the library. So the library is divided into several different sections, and I'm going to walk you through these and kind of where to get started about politics. So really getting them to understand this idea that elections are decided by those who show up. Um, if you don't show up, you don't, for your opinion, then somebody else is making the decision for you. And we have this on a video, which um, might be, this is the entire population nearly 8.5 million people. Okay, if you look at those population, who is eligible to vote? Who is 18? Who's a citizen who hasn't been adjudicated a felon and hasn't had the rights restored? You can see this is where we are in terms of the eligible voters and the non-eligible voters. The next slide will show you who registers to vote. So not every eligible voter registers. The next slide shows you who votes in a presidential election. You can see we've already got less than half the population is, is voting, um, casting ballots. And then that changes when you go to a governor's race. You know, the non-voters are starting to be three to one over the voters. And when we get to the general assembly elections, it's just a, just a fraction of the population is making decisions. And trying to get, you know, um, the students understand that, you know, they're, they're a powerless kid uh, who has no power in their house or in school, and they can understand decisions being made without them. And I think um, this will help, help me maybe perhaps connect with where they are. The next slide talks about what happens when you go from a, a large turnout election, the presidential race in 2016, and then you go to the governor's race in 2017. We, we have a concept, I don't know if we've invented it, I'm not a political scientist, but it's called voter retention. So the idea is this. If your precinct has 1,000 people that vote in a, a presidential race and then 750 turn out and vote in the governor's race, you've retained 75% of your voters. So overall, statewide, there was a voter retention of 62%. Only, you know, a little over half of voters who voted in the presidential bother to show up the next year in the governor's race. So how did that change when you looked at some demographic information? So if you go through, you see younger voters fell off. They didn't account for uh, the same percentage. There was fewer younger people making the decision for governor than there was for president. 
older people, a lot more older people are, are making these decisions. Again, this is who shows up and makes the decision. The next one is who's got a high school degree or less, a big fall off. And if you look at advanced degrees, big, big. So, you know, as, as the turnout goes down, typically, not always, but typically the population gets older, it gets more educated, and they're poor. Um, you see the low income people fall off, but the, the people that are high income are showing up and making these decisions. Also, if you look at race, there was a uh, race falls off in the in Africa. Caucasians are about at the state average. So one of the things that you may be teaching is redistricting, and boy, that is a tough one, right? That is so abstract. You gotta start with the population, then you gotta talk about apportionment of voters. So one way to talk about this, to capture their imagination, is kind of consider where you are in the state, right? And particularly if you're downstate, uh, if you're in southwest or south side of Virginia, you know, you start with your community. And it, it's all determined by population, right? The political representation follows population. So where is your locality in this? Is your locality growing and gaining power, I guess? Or, the next slide, is your population, is your county losing population? Is it losing, is it seeing, it's feeling the political power seep away. You know, I lived in Roanoke for a number of years as a reporter and the region just felt like we were being left behind. This next slide shows that. This is, you know, what has happened in the last two redistrictings in terms of the areas that lose population are losing seats in the House of Delegates. So, and they're all moving up to Northern Virginia. So, you know, how is this affecting your community? Kind of start there and then get into the idea of kind of the mechanics of it. Here's a look at the, the latest census numbers from the last census. The, it's a heat map, so the darker areas are growing faster than the lighter areas. The lightest areas are actually losing population. So again, where does your locality fit in here? Can you get students to care about that and understand what that means? The next slide, this is taking the population and projecting what that might mean for state senate districts. I believe these are state senate districts. So the areas that are kind of the, the gray are losing representation, and the areas that are, are orange are going to be gaining representation. So then we have some exercises. You probably have some of these you use yourself on how to explain how redistricting works. Ours is called Happy Valley, where there's, you know, two-thirds of the houses are green and one-third are purple, and then you, you kind of can assign your students Hey, draw some lines. Let's say you're the purple team. Kind of how can you rig this up to make it to your best effect? If you're the green team, how could you do it? And so if you walk through these slides, you could pack all the purple people into one district pretty much, or you could, um, you could give them no representation, um, or you could give them by, by spreading everybody out so it's just six green. Um, or you can find something that's more representative that actually has the same two-thirds representation. Um, and you know, if if you kind of if people compete, they understand that it's you want to win, and that's kind of the point of redistricting. Is that whoever is whoever is drawing the lines usually has has the power. Um, this is something. Okay, we'll go to money and politics. This is about small donations. These are donations of hundred dollars or less. And if you look back a couple of cycles in 2011, if you take all the Republicans running for the House and all the, the, the Democrats running for the House, they reported the same number of small donations. The bigger the face, the more small donors you got. You might want to see if anybody recognizes some faces. You fast forward to the last cycle, it was just unbelievable, uh, the, the change. You had several Democrats have as many small donors as all the Republicans combined. One, Dana Carone, had twice as many as all the Republicans combined. You know, they figured out how to do small dollar fundraising and energize their base. This is another one. This is, might be a little bit more chart literacy kind of scatter plot to show kids the correlation between money spent and votes received. As I tell people, it's, you know, you can't buy an election 
There's a lot of stories of candidates who spent the most and lose. Um, but it's kind of like love. Um, you can't buy love, boy, but it sure helps if you have a little coin in your pocket. Um, and, you know, without that, you can't be competitive. So this shows as the number of you raise, the amount of money you raise, um, it, it's represented in the percentage of vote you receive. There's a correlation there. You know, talk about money and politics, you know, where the money comes from. You can see this was in the presidential race. You know, Hillary Clinton, nearly all of her money came in Northern Virginia, right outside of D.C., a lot of it just strictly inside the Beltway, whereas Donald Trump, his money from Virginia was spread out across the state more evenly. You can talk about how money works in general assembly elections, where typically uh, in the, the funding profile of incumbents is very different than a challenger or an open seat. The incumbents traditionally have gotten about you know, a largest chunk of money comes from business lobbyists who uh, um, lobby the General Assembly. Uh, the money just kind of comes to them. Money follows the power. Um, but if you go to the next slide, there's a, in the new class of Democrats we looked at, and this is only three months, things could certainly have already changed, that, you know, if you look at what's happened in the past with freshmen in their first six months, they usually got about 40% of their money from corporate donors. This new class has only gotten 8%. You know, are they, are they you know, will they be able to invent a different way of funding their campaigns, or will they kind of revert to the mean? We'll, we'll see over time how that changed. This is kind of an interesting thing of how money's spent, so you could talk to your students about you know, how technology has changed. You can see the web, which was way down below, is, is moving up faster, and signs have kind of gone out of, out of fashion. How does that reflect and how, what they see around them in a campaign? They might find that interesting. Uh, the next slide, uh, we have on our site a way to look at all the bills in the General Assembly. You can search them by topic. And this is a really convoluted, uh, I know you can't read this because it's a lot there, but what it, the point of it is is that most floor votes are unanimous that come, that reach the floor and very few, relatively few, are actually contested along the way. And that's one thing to help them understand of kind of how not every bill at the General Assembly is, you know, even, even has one single vote against it. And kind of what does that mean? We also did a bill passage rate um, and looked at in the 2018 session, 34% of the bills were passed. And so you can, you can filter this by, if you click through this, will be, you know, Repu if you're a Republican party, you're, you have a higher percentage. You can, that might be, that might naturally follow. The Republicans are, in fact, in, in power in both houses where the Democrats are out of power. So they have a harder time passing things. Um, if you look at seniority, it certainly helps to know the system and have relationships. But if you're new, um, it's, it's much tougher. And likewise, if you're a woman, it's, it's still a tougher, tougher slide there, slog there than men. So those are some of the resources we have. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions, but I would encourage you to go and check out the site. Um, and we're, we hope to have our teacher workshops around the state again this year. We did four of them last year, and we hope to do that the same. We, um, we encourage everyone to apply when we... Um, when we do this, we, we pay you to come. We feel like you're, you're a professional, your time is worth uh, something, for, and you should be paid uh, to attend, we'll pay your mileage, and it's a great opportunity to get together with other teachers and share ideas of what's working in your classroom. Um, and, um, and, and it's really helpful to us to really understand how our information is used and how we can improve it. So um, I'm gonna pre appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to put the time into you know, professional development and uh, you have, like I said when I started, you have a very difficult job and I, I salute every, every single one of you. So, yes. Yes, all, of those, all of those slides that you showed us, those are all on the website under those different headings? They, some of, most like, of them are, uh, Allie Mislowski from my staff back here just added a bunch of them the other day, 
If you can't find them in the education section, if you go to our visual section on our website, you, and you, um, you can search by keyword and by topic. So we tried to put some on the, edu not all of them, but uh, we think that's the ones that will be most useful on the education site, but we have a fuller li library here. And do you have sample lessons tied around some of these things? We don't have, we don't have sample lessons. We've kind of debated that. We've heard from some teachers they really would like a lesson, and others were more like, I've got a lesson. This would be great to plug in what I've got. And so um, that's, but we don't have right now any, any lesson plans. But it would, would, I don't know, show hands, would lesson plans help? Okay. Yes. I created a lesson plan for my kids to look at campaign finance um, because not on the K-12 part of this website, but on like the regular adult part, you can see uh, how much the candidates have raised and then you can see where the top contributors came from and then you can use the Open Secrets website to see who those contributors are. But, so I created a lesson, the whole thing went through it, made sure it made sense and then you guys changed the website because it was oh, right no. before the election, so I was like, oh my God. Because I teach seventh graders. So if anything's not exactly like it says in the directions, it's a big deal. So it was okay, like we worked through it on the fly, and I'll just, you know, next time I do it, I'll check it the night before. But one of the other things that I thought was really awesome is like Tim Kaine had raised, raised like $22 million, and they had looked the information up on Friday, the weekend went, and then we came back to school on the Monday before the election day and the money that he had had dropped to 15 million. And they were like, where did the seven million go, Miss Locke? And I said, well, where do you think it went? And they're like, all those campaign ads I saw this weekend. I was like, yes, exactly, that's what's going on. So it was cool because with the website, they could see that the money was being spent, like that it was fluctuating. So I, I, this website's great. You could spend hours looking at it and geek out. Well, thanks. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? Well, great. I don't want to stand in the way of you and lunch. So um, anyway, thank you for having me.